Please, Dirk, take it away. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Will. It's a pleasure again after last week. Uh, it's a pleasure again to do it this week with a more specialized uh, presentation of which you have seen the abstract. Um, so let me go here on, on, the, on the full screen mode. Um, yeah, so I'm telling you a little bit about uh, the theory of uh, relativistic dissipative fluid dynamics. I'd like to uh, uh, explain a bit about the foundations of this theory from a microscopic point of view. Uh, and then also after this is clarified, discuss a few applications. There are lots of people to thank. These are my friends and collaborators over the years. So uh, Will said, is there anybody in the community whom you do, do not thank? I said, no, well, there are actually some people who, whom I don't mention with, with whom I have collaborated, but somehow they don't appear in, in, this, in the citations later and I left them out. So the, the list is actually already abbreviated. Okay, so um, I will jump right into the heart of matters, uh, the conservation laws. Can I get this thing here too? Yeah. The conservation laws we already discussed last week. Uh, there's particle number conservation and there's energy momentum conservation. And the particle four current, diver four divergence of particle four current vanishes, and uh, the four divergence of the energy momentum tensor vanishes. And uh, microscopically, this is something we also discussed last week. Uh, in order to compute this, uh, this current, you take some averaging of the four momentum of a particle. K mu is the four momentum of a particle. Um, K zero is the on-shell energy. So this is always uh, how I define this. Um, and, and these angular brackets is an average over the single particle distribution function. Um, and uh, the averaging is done with this invariant, Lorentz invariant momentum space measure. So it looks a little bit different than the non-relativistic counterpart that we discussed last time. That's simply because this D3K integral requires this one over energy to make it Lorentz invariant. So, um, so in the zeroth component of this guy here, K0, and then the K0 would cancel with this guy. And then you would simply have the particle density as we have discussed it last, last week. And so relativistically, you have to be careful about these extra factors. And, and that's simply the definition. Huh? And particle four current is just this K mu average and energy momentum tensor is K mu K mu average. And of course I'm implicitly assuming I, I'm in a classical picture of an ensemble of particles, just as we discussed last week, where you, you have a distribution that can be computed from the Boltzmann equation. And uh, once you know this, then you perform this averaging here, this integration of a momentum space. And then you get this object here. And it's, of course, oversimplifying many things, but let's take this for a given. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh -huh. So now the, 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 the immediate problem that you see is the following. Yeah? I mean, suppose you are going to solve these equations. This is one scalar equation. This is a vector equation, Lorentz vector equation, so four equations, the five equations, but in general, a four current has four degrees of freedom and a symmetric, symmetric energy momentum tensor, you know, symmetric in the two Lorentz indices has 10 degrees of freedom. Yeah. So a uh, totally general bank two Lorentz tensor would have 16, uh, four by four, but the symmetry of this object reduces this to uh, the diagonal plus the six off diagonal independent six, uh, six off diagonal components. No? So 14 degrees of freedom, five equations. You can solve this in this way. No? You need to provide extra information. And in order to see how this goes, let me do something that looks at first sight a bit complicated, but it, it's not actually so, so uh, weird what I'm writing here. Suppose you have a four vector, which I call U, and later on I will identify this four vector with fluid four velocity, which is a time-like normalized vector and has this simple structure in the local rest frame of the fluid. And if you do this tensor decomposition, you can always get a component of this four current parallel to this U mu vector. 
and n is simply the projection of, of n u on u mu. This is the particle density in the local rest frame. Okay, this e sub k is uh, um, the energy in the local rest frame. But in general, I use it for the scalar product of k with u. This is what this symbol e sub k is supposed to mean. And this averaging is what, is what I explained in the last transparency. So this is the component parallel to u. And then the rest is, the remainder of nu is the component orthogonal to u. And in order to uh, compute this, I have to introduce this three space projector of this form here, delta. And then uh, I apply delta onto n. Okay, so this these angular bracket notation, uh, I should have introduced that here. This always means, uh, angular bracket notation means delta times n in this case. No? Oh, sorry, here it is. Any vector a with these angular brackets means delta times this vector. So you project the four vector onto the components, uh, the three components orthogonal to you. No? And then this is basically this object here. And this is the particle diffusion current. It's the uh, diffusion of particles relative to the flow of the fluid. If u is the fluid flow velocity, this tells you how much particles diffuse relative to u. And you can do the same composition with the energy momentum tensor. It's a bit more complicated as, as it is a rank two tensor. Um, you get the energy density here, which you can also get by projection. Okay, uh, you get something that is the isotropic pressure that has actually two components. Um, the thermodynamic pressure and the so-called bulk viscous pressure. So this guy here get also from a projection of T mu nu. Um, and then you have also in general, you have also uh, energy and momentum diffusion. W is the energy momentum diffusion current, it's basically the flow of energy or momentum relative to the flow of the fluid. Okay. And then the last thing that you have in this decomposition is something that is orthogonal to both indices, in both indices to u. So you get this, this double projected quantity. So the angular brackets around two Lorentz indices. Oh, I made a mistake. This should be mu nu. Okay, sorry about this. And, uh, and this actually is, uh, is uh, this uh, rank four symmetric traceless three space projector. So it's a generalization of this object here from rank two to rank four. And you, you subtract the trace because the trace is in principle contained in this pi. So you can make this traceless. Okay, so um, I don't know whether you followed it all in details. I mean, if, if, if n mu was, uh, was basically this definition and I multiply this with u mu, then I get actually k mu u mu under the averaging, but k mu u mu is this ek. And if you do this twice with two factors of u, you get ek squared and so forth. So all these, Things are uh, nicely explained, and this mistake here I will correct, and also this mistake here I will correct. Obviously, I changed indices at some point in the preparation of this talk, but okay, this is a typo. No, this should be mu nu. This also. All right. So what can we uh, what can we do with this? This looks much more complicated than before. Well, the splitting actually has a has a nice feature, um, and the feature is the following. Let me call n epsilon and this thermodynamic pressure, let me call this primary fluid dynamical quantities. And everything that I colored in red here, let me call this dissipative quantities for, for a reason I will explain to you in the next slide. So um, the simplest theory of fluid dynamics is if you assume that the fluid is an ideal fluid, that means you would neglect all these dissipative quantities that were shown here in red. Keep only the green stuff, and you end up with this very simple structure of the current and the energy momentum tensor. This has six degrees of freedom. It has N, E, and uh, pressure, and the three independent components of the fluid velocity. But um, uh, if you provide an equation of state, a thermodynamic equation of state in this form, then P is no longer independent, and you have actually five degrees of freedom, five, five equations of motion, and you can solve this theory uniquely. And uh, the implicit assumption, of course, is that, that this n and epsilon, n and e, 
okay, E and epsilon, okay, sometimes I use both. And they are actually um, particle density and energy density of a system in local thermodynamical equilibrium. So you can actually use this thermodynamic equation or state to compute the pressure. And so ideal fluid dynamics is a, is a theory of a fluid which at each space-time point is in local thermodynamical equilibrium. So you can use all the great relations of statistical mechanics and thermodynamics to uh, relate quantities, okay? And, and that is the, that's all that there is about. And then you can go up and, and solve, solve the equations for given boundary conditions, initial conditions and so forth, okay? But if we uh, want to keep the thing uh, dissipative, then there is, there is uh, of course, uh, more to be done. So if I keep all the red stuff, the dissipative stuff, and so I mean, before, if, 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 if I make this implicit assumption, eh, then it's clear that these green guys, they, they will always have to do something with local equilibrium. I can always relate them to some local equilibrium, um, but the red stuff I cannot. Eh? So if this is what is this in local equilibrium, then the red stuff must be that which is out of local equilibrium, which means which is dissipative, okay? So um, you can do your degree of freedom counting in the tensor decomposition. Uh, let's do this very naively. Yeah? So we have again here six. We have this bulk viscous pressure, which is one. We have the particle diffusion current that is actually orthogonal to the fluid velocity by construction. So it has only three independent components. Same for the uh, energy momentum diffusion. And then five for the shear stress tensor pi mu nu, um, because it's orthogonal to u and it's traceless. No? So instead of 10, uh, no, you have actually five conditions, tracelessness, and then this four equations which kill you uh, the projection onto u. Uh, this has five degrees of freedom. If you count this, this is 18. I can, of course, not be, no? because you started with 14, and you can, where, where did the extra four, extra four components came from? Well, the point is that uh, I call this fluid velocity, but so far it was just a fixed four vector. I didn't assign it any physical meaning. If you do that, you immediately eliminate or relate uh, six of these degrees of freedom to each other, three to each to other three. Then for instance, there is, a, um, there is this uh, famous choice of frame. You can say, okay, I, my, my fluid, uh, I'm considering the flow of energy. So I call basically what flows is the flow of energy. That means u mu is energy flow. That means there cannot be any diffusion of energy or momentum relative to u. So you would immediately set this w to zero in the choice of lambda. So instead of 80, you have 50. Or another interesting choice is if you say, I follow the flow of particle number, then I cannot diffuse particles relative to you. No? So that means the particle diffusion current is zero, okay? And then from these 15 remaining degrees of freedom, uh, you have to make one more assumption. For instance, uh, you say my energy density and particle number density are those uh, which, uh, are, which are the same as particle energy density of a fictitious local equilibrium state. No? So that means um, if I say there is a fictitious state in local equilibrium with the same energy density and same particle number density, uh, that allows me to use thermodynamics, uh, in particular to use the equation of state uh, to eliminate one more degree of freedom, namely the thermodynamic pressure that's then also no longer an independent degree of freedom. And, and then you have it done. Uh, you have uh, mapped 14 to 14, uh, 14 on the left side to 14 independent on the right side. Uh, are, are you still following me? Let me briefly interrupt here before going on. Yeah, I think I am. I, I was just wondering earlier, yeah. I don't know if it'll come up uh, now, the sort of combination of W and U, is there a physical meaning as to why there's two terms there instead of just one? Is it just- Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. That it, that's right. Um, um, I should have- uh, probably divided by one half. Uh, I, I added a symmetric combination of these two, no? because this guy is, was symmetric by construction. And uh, if I write W mu, u nu, 
then I should add the symmetrized counterpart. Yeah. You, if you want it, you can add a factor of one half. So you basically take the symmetric combination. The anti-symmetric one cannot appear if this thing is supposed to be symmetric. No? Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, but it's a good question, yeah. Very good. All right. Yeah. Maybe, then, um, one other question. How do you yeah. distinguish between the pressure and then the the pi, the p and the pi with yeah, the breakdown exactly. there? So this splitting in principle by this uh, projection here, you cannot. No? I mean, it's basically, if you have a given team you knew, this projection, uh, um, I mean, the tra tra tracing with delta and then dividing by three, the dimensionality of the subspace um, gives you just the isotropic pressure in the system. No? And you don't know how much the P is and how much pi is. But if you do the lambda matching, okay, then, and you know what the equation of state is, then you can uniquely compute P from epsilon and n. Okay, and then you know the difference between uh, the isotropic pressure and this thermodynamic pressure must be the pi. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, so uh, in the following, I will, I will just use Landau's definition, um, not to complicate things too much. And, um, and then, of course, uh, I still have the, the problem. I have five equations and, and 14 unknowns. So where do I get the nine extra equations from? And, um, and this goes under the name of uh, providing constitutive relations for these quantities, for the dissipative quantities. And the simplest thing that people assumed was, ah, okay, um, how, does, how does this deviation from, uh, uh, sorry, so in global equilibrium, Right? If the system was in global equilibrium, all dissipation was zero. Yeah? So if I'm uh, near local equilibrium, yeah? so I can whatever think of fictitious equilibrium states where I can extract an equation state from, I must be at least near equilibrium. But uh, local means there are still gradients in my fluid fields, basically. So basically in the in the N E and and also as a, in, in the primary fluid dynamical quantities, N and E and P, and also in the fluid velocity field, there are gradients. And these gradients are um, what cause the deviation from global equilibrium, which is everything constant, no gradient. No? So small, small differences, small gradients in these primary fluid dynamical quantities, they actually drive the dissipation in the system. No? And that is, uh, so you formally you would say you make an expansion in gradients of primary fluid dynamical quantities. Um, I'll tell you in a moment how this comes about. But to first order, you take just first order gradients and then you relate your dissipative quantities to these gradients. So um, this is what is done here. This is also what one does in non-relativistic Navier-Stokes theory. Um, suppose you... Um, yeah, so in principle, the bulk viscous pressure comes somehow from the uh, tendency of the system to expand. So this theta is the so-called expansion scalar. Right? It's basically in non-relativistic physics, it would be the three divergence of the fluid field. Okay. So and and the and the resistance that the that the system uh, uh, has towards this free expansion is uh, basically bulk viscosity yeah? and it comes with a minus sign because it's a resistance, it reduces the pressure. Pressure usually drives the system isotropically apart, but if there's uh, basically dissipation, that tendency is reduced. So that's why there's a minus sign yeah? and it's proportional to this flow field, this divergence of the fluid velocity and the zeta is called the bulk viscosity coefficient. Yeah? And the same here with uh, particle diffusion, there's a um, particle diffusion coefficient and and particle diffusion comes if you have if you have the gradients in density, okay? So uh, if your particle number density has a gradient somewhere, but uh, I could have written this in terms of a density gradient, but it turns out that when you set this theory up, it's actually not the density itself, but it's something like uh, the logarithm of density, which is this, uh, or the logarithm of fugacity, which is the ratio of chemical potential over temperature, yeah? where mu and t are actually the uh, 
the, the temperature and the chemical potential of this fictitious local equilibrium state from which you computed epsilon zero and n zero huh? from the, equa the equation of state. Huh? I wrote it also here. Huh? So n zero epsilon zero can be written as functions of T and mu. This is the same T and mu that enters in this alpha. So gradients of alpha basically drive particle diffusion. And, and, the, and the shear stress tensor pi mu nu um, is proportional to the shear of the fluid flow. Huh? So the sigma is the so-called shear tensor. It's basically how, gradient, how the gradients work out in your, in your fluid field. And there's like another typo. This should be mu nu huh? uh, in indices. I will repair this. This on the eta is then the shear viscosity coefficient. So this is Navier Stokes theory. And you see, uh, you provided relations for the uh, dissipative bond. It's nine, nine relations, five plus three plus one, in terms of gradients of primary fluid dynamic quantities and the fluid velocity. So gradients of mu and t and gradients of u. Okay, and they were already entering the equations previously. No, I mean, so basically, if you do this replacement, you expressed all again. You, no, I mean, you did it here. You expressed all these fourteen components basically just in terms of five independent variables. And and if you do Navier-Stokes theory, you, you did precisely the same. No? There is still u, the three components of u, and then there is n and e that enter somehow the calculation of alpha. And also the transport coefficients are usually functions of T and U because they're computed near equilibrium. So this whole setup is closed and you can start trying to solve this. The, the uh, problem, sorry. yeah? Uh, I see in your definition of the gradient, you've got the bracketed index, you've got uh, ah, bracketed yeah. new. Is yeah. that just a feature of the Landau rest frame or is it? No, uh, that, ah, no. no this, is, uh, this is because, yeah. Okay, this is because the V mu was also orthogonal to U. So, I mean, you could have used the normal partial derivative, no? but the, the component parallel to U would drop out. No? So, um, sure, yeah. Break the things again here, no? you see, uh, uh, you, you can easily immediately project no? because the, the V here, that is already orthogonal. No? So it makes okay. sense to use this three space projector. Yeah, you can know. All right. Yeah, so the problem is that uh, these equations are causal and unstable as was shown some time ago. Um, and I'm not going to explain this in more detail. That would be topic of a more specialized seminar. But in essence, you can think of this as follows. If, if the view V mu is already a gradient of something, and if I then put it into the equations of motion here, here, N mu is uh, V mu was a gradient. And now I take the four derivative of this, I get basically a double spatial gradient. So I have one time derivative and the quadratic spatial derivative. And that is the diffusion equation in essence. Yeah? There's a standard diffusion equation that you have probably seen in some standard lecture. And that is R causal, okay? Uh, you can instantaneously diffuse particles with uh, arbitrary, uh, to arbitrary distances. No? It violates causality. So that's behind this. So that is no good. In a relativistic setting, you don't want that. I mean, neither, cause, neither would you want to violate causality in non-relativistic physics, nor would you want to uh, make the system inherently unstable. <laughs> OK, so, um, so the, the way to repair this is uh, under the, goes under the name of transient fluid dynamics. So you, you neglected some transients in, your, in the evolution of your diff of your dissipative quantities and you have to put them back in. Yeah, so you cannot simply instantaneously uh, think that dissipative quantities instantaneously assume the values given here. Yeah. So you, you would uh, extend, extend the equations, yeah, the Navier-Stokes equations are still here, but you extend this by the green terms. You would need, um, you need the dissipative quantities to you need to give them time to adjust to the forces on the right hand side to these gradients. This is called dissipative force, no? so that X basically, and, and you need uh, the, the dissipative quantities, uh, you need to give them some time to adjust to these forces. And it requires you to introduce these relaxation times. This dot is precisely what you think it is. It's the time derivative in the local rest frame, but if you write it relativistically, you would use the co-moving derivative. No? 
Okay, and these towers here are the relaxation times. They, uh, they, they can be computed as we'll see later, but once you do that, you can actually show that the whole thing is, so the idea is, is actually goes actually back to Müller and Israel and Stuart, Müller in the non-relativistic setup first and then Israel and Stuart. And uh, you can show that, uh, that, um, that these equations are causal and stable. Uh, we were not the first to show this there also. Hiscock and Lindblom also looked at this. So uh, I wrote this, uh, tacitly I wrote a second order theory without explaining this. Um, why, why, so, and I also call this first order. Oh, okay, here you could think first order because I talk about first order and gradients. Then you could actually add higher order gradients. They will not help you. They will not repair causality issues. Um, so first order gradients means first order theory. That's very simple to understand. Um, why second order? I can, I can only see a time derivative or this co-moving derivative here. So this is just one, one derivative. So why is this not still a first order theory in gradients? Okay, and the counting is as follows. This is something related to how you power count. So the dissipative quantities, now, of course you always assume that these guys are not far from equilibrium. Now, these dissipative quantities are small compared to the primary fluid dynamical quantities. I didn't write this down here, but the ratio basically of uh, pi over thermodynamic pressure would be the uh, inverse Reynolds number. We call this inverse Reynolds number related to pi. And you can do this for V divided by density. Then you would get the inverse Reynolds number related to particle diffusion. And then the same for shear, uh, for shear, shear stress. You can divide this by pressure again and then get the inverse Reynolds number for, for shear stress. And near equilibrium, these Reynolds numbers are small quantities, okay? And you also assume that gradients are small, right? because I said, well, uh, you're in local equilibrium, but I mean, you approach global equilibrium. So you can't take two large gradients. Gradients uh, are usually of order Knudsen number. So it's a microscopic length scale related to the mean free path of scatterings of particles no, that comes from the Boltzmann equation, for instance, divided by the scale given by the hydrodynamic gradients, which I just call L hydro. No, and fluid dynamics is actually a theory where um, the Knudsen number is small, basically where you look at long wavelength phenomena, that you have little particles moving in your fluid and they scatter on a short scale, lambda, mean free path, but you actually have gradients which are long wave phenomena, long wavelength phenomena. So both of these guys are small, inverse Reynolds number and Knudsen number are small. The Navier-Stokes term, you see these are the gradient terms. The, the gradient means this is this one over L hydro that enters, okay? And Navier-Stokes is first order, but the relaxation terms here, they uh, involve a gradient and they involve a quantity uh, which is of order inverse Reynolds number. So, so if both are small of order one, then the product is order two. Okay, and that's why these transient fluid dynamical theories are called second order theories. Okay, did we get this? Let me pause for one second, not to lose too many people. Okay, good. Now, yeah, then of course, uh, we wrote down one type of second order term, but there are many more. Up to second order, you can write down all terms allowed by Lorentz symmetry, okay? And, and, and you see, uh, you would supplement what we wrote down before, you would supplement then by, by these terms here, by the green, red, and blue terms. And I can show you what they are. These are all, so the green terms are other terms like these green terms, terms of order Knudsen times inverse Reynolds. Eh? So it's the gradient of some dissipative quantity, or you can see uh, dissipative quantity times the gradient of pressure. Eh? F is here the gradient of pressure and so forth. You go through all these terms. I don't explain them in detail. Uh, everything here is uh, of this order. And, uh, and you see new transport coefficients arising, many new transport. They're all transport coefficients related, second order transport coefficients. No? Omega is the fluid vorticity that also appears here, as you can see in some terms. Now, this is the green stuff. You can also write down the red stuff. Red stuff is actually Knudsen squared. So always gradient squared. Right? So for instance, uh, expansion scalar squared. Right? This I mu 
is the gradient of uh, alpha. Okay, so I mu squared is Knudsen squared, no? and so forth. You go through all this list again with new transport coefficients. Everything is uh, Knudsen squared, and then you can also write down inverse Reynolds squared. You see, uh, everything allowed by Lorentz symmetry you can write down. For instance, bulk pressure squared, or diffusion current squared, or shear stress tensor squared. No? Whatever you do, you just have to make sure that your indices match up. No? So in the scalar equation, you have to construct scalars. In a vector, you have to construct vectors. And in a tensor, you have to construct tensors. And uh, when you count all these uh, transport coefficients, you come up to 57. I listed them here again. And of course, all of them need to be computed somehow. No? As a, not only the first order transport coefficients, eta kappa eta, also all these second order transport coefficients. That's of course a major task. And for that, you need a microscopic theory. You can only, you see, I mean, all these transport coefficients, they contain microphysics in, in a, in a, on the level of uh, an effective theory. Yeah, if you consider fluid dynamics as an effective theory, you would call them the low energy constants of the effective theory and the, the fields where you take gradients of, the, you would call them the degrees of freedom. So we want to compute uh, the microscopic uh, input to fluid dynamics, the transport coefficient. So we need a microscopic theory, uh, which is of course the Boltzmann equation, right? I mean, we, we discussed that at length last, last week. Here's my Boltzmann equation uh, written in this relativistic uh, form, which I showed you last, last week, except I call momentum K now because H bar usually I take to be one. So wave number and momentum are the same, doesn't matter. So as I said, the first two actually did this um, in a relativistic setting were Israel and Stuart. And they, uh, they it went as follows. So they made an answer. They said, okay, my single particle distribution function, which comes out of the Boltzmann equation, is actually, it can be decomposed in terms of the local equilibrium distribution. Okay. Uh, local meaning that beta, which is one over temperature and alpha are functions of and u, which is hiding here in the EK, u are functions of space time. And so, but this is usually the Fermi Dirac or Bose Einstein distribution. No? And, and then there's a deviation. And the deviation is of order is small, as we'll see in a second. No? So you, you consider small deviations from equilibrium. Um, the delta F can be further decomposed in this form. Uh, don't worry about this F tilde. That is, if you have quantum statistics, that's how, how this appears. But in essence, you introduce 14 new variables to, parametra, to parametrize your deviation from local equilibrium. And these are these magenta colored quantities, epsilon, epsilon mu, and epsilon mu nu. And this has one, this has four, this has only nine independent degrees of freedom because the trace of this guy, the trace of epsilon mu nu, you can actually put into epsilon. The trace would go like mass squared, K, K mu, K mu is mass squared. And then you have a term which proposal mass squared in epsilon, which you absorb in epsilon. So nine, four, 14 variables in total. And then you directly match these new parameters. Then you insert this ansatz into your definition of N mu and T mu nu from slide number one. I don't, I don't go back. And you just brutally compute and relate these variables in terms of the dissipative quantities, all right? So this green stuff is again some thermodynamic functions, complicated functions of T and U, and uh, and the red stuff is our dissipative quantities, okay? And you see the variables are actually of proportional to inverse Reynolds number, no? it's a pi T, T mu and pi mu nu, and, and that's it. You close the theory, right? I mean this ansatz that, that they made just works in terms of. Um, 14 variables. No? So these, these guys are not really new parameters. They are uniquely relatable to dissipative quantities. Okay. And now you just need to find the constitutive relations. And they knew exactly because they had invented this transient fluid dynamics. You can't just use uh, Navier Stokes to uh, compute pi and blah, blah, blah. And you need these dynamical equations for you know, these differential equations here, which uh, allow you to uh, adjust to the forces in, in a certain time span. And uh, what they did was the following. Right? They uh, simply took the first three moments of the Boltzmann equation. They knew the first moment of the Boltzmann, moment meaning integral over, 
of a uh, momentum space. No? First moment here of this guy, that's what we discussed last, last week also. No? This is then basically if you pull del mu out, you get basically average of k mu, which is n mu. No? So from the first moment, you get a particle number conservation. Uh, particle is conserved in binary collision. So the collision, the moment of the collision integral vanishes. And um, the next moment is you multiply the Boltzmann equation with k nu, and then again integrate over k. And you see pulling del mu out gives you k mu k nu, which is actually average, which is t mu nu. So, and here you get k nu collision integral, ever, I mean integrated. That's uh, in, energy and momentum are uh, collisional invariant, so that's also zero. So, so the first two moments of the Boltzmann equation immediately give you energy a particle number and energy momentum conservation. But you need an additional, you need additional equations, nine additional equations, to determine the dissipative quantities. And then they said, okay, very simple. Let's take the third moment of the Boltzmann equation, so multiply with k lambda k nu, right? And uh, if I pull del mu out, I have this k mu k nu k lambda's average structure. And now, of course, the right hand side is no longer zero because k nu k lambda uh, moment of the collision term is, is not zero. No? So, this is where all the dissipative dynamics hides. Um, you can actually see that these are uh, one plus four plus nine equations. Why, why nine? Okay, you would think this is a symmet in new lambda, this is a symmetric tensor. So, it should be 10, but the trace of this guy. Is related to n mu, and the trace of c here uh, is related to the first the first moment of the collision integrals of zero. Yeah. So um, so this is what they did, and there's not more to say. And this is basically uh, what Israel Stewart set up. And there are some shortcomings which I would like to discuss. Now. So first of all, uh, they simply truncated their expansion here at the, at the second order in momentum. Okay, ad hoc. And you cannot improve this further. And then they said, okay, well, so, so you could ask why, why take just the third moment of the Boltzmann equation? Why not multiply this with an arbitrary power of k, k alpha, k beta, k, and so forth. It would give you the same information. It would also allow you to determine your dissipative quantities from this equation of motion. Right? So there's an arbitrariness and it's also ad hoc. And the improvement that uh, we invented some time ago which we call resum transient relativistic fluid dynamics, but nobody calls it that. They all call it DNMR theory. That is, is uh, that actually remedies these shortcomings. And I'll briefly exp explain this to you. I should speed up a bit, otherwise I run out of time. Yeah? So instead of uh, K, uh, the, the, this, uh, this tensor product of Ks, we actually projected that uh, onto the, with this rank L symmetric, rank 2L, I should have written another typo, rank 2L symmetric traceless three space projection operators. These are called irreducible tensors because they are irreducible under uh, the little group of uh, Lorentz transformations um, between flat frames, so with, with uh, fluid velocity. And um, because this thing is basically orthogonal to fluid velocity. Then. So, and they have an orthogonality relation. So these guys actually form a basis in tensor space. And then of course, in, in the local rest frame, these are just three momenta. So you also need to put in the energy somehow. So you define orthogonal polynomials in this energy variable EK, okay? And uh, you averaging for later purposes, I have to split this average between average with the, with the equilibrium distribution and this correction. That's the same as in Israel's tour. And then uh, I have to introduce the so-called irreducible moments, which are, if you average with the correction to the single particle distribution function, you can do this with arbitrary powers of energy, half power of energy and rank L in momentum in these irreducible tensors. And these, these objects are called irreducible moments. And, uh, since delta F is of order inverse Reynolds number, also these irreducible moments are of order inverse Reynolds number for the power count. Okay, and then, naja, I don't know whether I should explain all this in detail. I mean, some irreducible moments actually correspond to fluid dynamical variables. We've seen this before. This particle density is this moment. If you do the splitting between equilibrium and correction, 
to equilibrium. And then you see this was the uh, equilibrium particle number density. And this is the first moment, rho one, which I defined down here. No? So energy power one, but no power of momentum. So this is rho one. And uh, for energy density, you can do the same. For pressure, you can do this. No? And you, you see, you can relate all fluid dynamical variables to some of these irreducible moments. But you see, these are gen generically of low index in energy no? one, two, zero, one, is, is, and, and also low index in tensor rank, no? low in tensor rank. So scalars, vectors, and uh, rank two tensors. No? And, and then you can see. I actually uh, assume tacitly that some see the splitting of zero plus delta, some, some things dropped out here in the dissipative calculation. So here I did the splitting between equilibrium and correction in P plus pi, but here the, the equilibrium doesn't appear. That's because of this orthogonality relation of these irreducible tensors. So, so the dissipative quantities are directly proportional to these irreducible moments. And Landau matching simplifies the counting also a bit. And Landau frame choice would actually set this moment to zero. Okay. So, uh, and then you, uh, your single particle distribution function is not just an ansatz as in Israel Stewart, but it's, it is actually an expansion using the basis in momentum space of irreducible tensors and these polynomials in energy. You see, this is not the P polynomial that enters here, but it's. A combination of p polynomials doesn't matter. No? This is basically an exact expansion. If you go to arbitrary order in tensor rank, in arbitrary order in polynomial in powers of e, which are hiding in these polynomials p, no? it's an exact expansion, no ansatz. But of course, you have to. You can't do this for infinitely many of these guys. You have to truncate somewhere. No? But since uh, these guys are orthogonal and the, the polynomials are orthogonal. Whenever you truncate at some finite value of tensor rank, rank L max and finite number in energy power NL, you do that at any, if you truncate at as finite numbers, you always define a closed subset of irreducible moments. You can operate on the subspace and, and you will never leave this. So you don't leave, leave the subspace of variables that you're working on. And you can systematically improve and so forth. And, of course, in hydrodynamics, I usually restrict myself to rank two tensors. No? So n mu t mu nu. So my L max will implicitly be just two in the following. No? And then you see the lowest order approximations take the smallest number of nL. Okay. As we would say, I'll take nL equal zero, n zero equal zero, and one equal zero, and two equal zero. Well, uh, you can actually do a bit better. You can go to n one equal one and n, n zero equal two. Yeah, because um, by Landau matching and Landau frame choice, some of these guys are zero anyway. They don't enter this expansion. Right? But if you if you formally do this, you would have three scalar moments, two vector moments, irreducible moments, and one tensor irreducible moment. You count variables; these are fourteen moments. So the fourteen moment approximation in, in, for Israel Stewart, it was uh, this brutal matching. In, of epsilon, epsilon mu, and epsilon mu nu. In, for our case, it's, it's actually taking this smallest number of irreducible moments. Okay, and, uh, and of course, uh, you don't lose any information by, by Landau matching, Landau frame choice, because the dynamical variables that you set to zero are actually replaced by n epsilon and u mu. So you work in, in a space of 14 variables. And then you, and then you, instead of taking arbitrary moments of the Boltzmann equation, you actually compute the time evolution. This is definition here no, of this quantity on the left, time evolution of irreducible moments. You can do this because you define these guys and you just have to compute this the derivative of the argument here under the integral and then project. And this is an infinite set of coupled equations for all these irreducible moments, which you truncate, of course. No? Otherwise, you can't solve it. At, the, at this point, it's formally totally equivalent to the Boltzmann equation. So um, I didn't write all these terms there. This is very complicated. But they at least of order Knudsen number. And, and the C I wrote down, this is the collision integral. It's the mo a moment of the collision term in the Boltzmann equation. OK. 
And uh, okay, the next step is you linearize this collision integral in powers of delta f. That means it's linear in these irreducible moments. And then you diagonalize this collision matrix here, find the eigenvalues, find eigenmodes. I'm not going through all the details now. Let's allow me to be a bit brief here. You, you look at the equation of motion for the eigenmodes. So now the mode equations decouple. You can, by the, by the largest, um, by the smallest eigenvalue of the collision matrix, you can identify the slowest eigenmode. Right? The, the smallest chi here gives you the longest time scale um, of evolution. And um, because uh, if you divide by chi, one over chi would be something like this relaxation time that we had in these equations before. So the smallest chi gives you the longest relaxation time. Those are taken to be dynamical and all faster guys I just simply approximate by the asymptotic values. And then um, you can, by this relation here between eigenmodes and irreducible moments, you can compute these guys uh, and you see um, the, Z, the R equals zero guy here you know, is basically uh, the S equals zero term here, omega zero zero being equal to one. So it's up to corrections of order Knudsen number, the uh, rho zero irreducible moments are equal to the eigenmodes. And that means um, the eigenmode, if I invert this relation, the eigenmode is, scalar eigenmode is basically just bulk viscous pressure plus corrections. Vector eigenmode is particle diffusion plus corrections and uh, tensor eigenmode is pi mu nu plus corrections. And then once you have this here, you go back up here and then for all irreducible moments, you can find relations. I mean, I didn't write them explicitly, but this order includes and they were all taken into account to write this down. And then you see, now you close your system of equations of motion. And I mean, in these, in these equations, for rho zero here, for i equals zero, you had of course all higher moments also, but you replace all of them basically by the dissipative quantities plus corrections. No? And then you closed your system of equations of motion. And the end of the day, you get precisely these equations here with explicit expressions for your transport coefficients given by the coefficients that you read off after you did this precisely. So I'm I'm certainly not uh, explaining all the details, no? but uh, it's systematically improvable. If you enlarge your polynomial basis, no? then you can see. So for instance, for shear stress, no? this was the 40 moment approximation, but if you go to, if you increase this N2, let's say to 41, you see how these values start to converge for the shear viscosity coefficient, as well as for all other transport coefficients shown here. No? I mean, they, approach values given by chapman Enskog theory, which is very gratifying. You can also Im improve it by taking more dynamical moments. Yeah? This is what we call then the 23 moment approximation. And we could show that this gives you a better description of heat flow, fantastic. And something that nobody has done yet, but maybe you are now inspired to do it, uh, go to higher uh, rank tensors no? in irreducible moments. Uh, I, I think I have at most 10 minutes. I started five minutes late. So let me briefly show you some applications of what we have, what, what we can do with this DNMR theory. So we also were able to um, uh, uh, generalize this to a system of particles in electromagnetic fields. First spin zero particles. So the Boltzmann equation changes. It gets uh, this uh, extra term here. It's a force term which we discussed last week. Now you see how this looks relativistically. In electromagnetic fields, this is the field strength tensor that goes in here. And the coupling is of course via electric charge. And then you turn the crank and do uh, lots of calculations. And you see that uh, your equations that we had previously, you see I, the gray stuff is my, was my original uh, second order dissipative fluid dynamics. The gray stuff is modified by the by the new terms here on the right hand side. And so, of course, um, there is a, there is a, the energy momentum balance is, is of course uh, influenced by electromagnetic fields, no? basically the Lorentz force on the, on the particle current that changes the energy momentum balance. 
but you get also corrections uh, for for bulk uh, for the bulk viscous pressure for the particle diffusion and for the shear stress tensor no? and the proportional to e and b these these four vectors e and b are electric field in the fluid rest frame and magnetic field in the fluid rest frame properly generalized to look like four vectors although they do not transform as four vectors one has to be careful no? this is a rank two lorentz tensor these are not four vectors here okay although they look like that now yeah i i don't there are a couple of slides which i simply ask you to uh, to look at later if i will send uh, will the corrected slides after i removed all the typos no, i mean there are some some uh, things you can you can derive from uh, from the relations on the previous transparency like this wiedemann trans law let me skip over this uh, you can also look at the navier stokes limit by just looking at the first order terms uh, and um, actually you will see that in, ele in electromagnetic fields uh, the viscosity coefficients split up no? so you will have three uh, bulk viscosity coefficients related to whether it's viscosity parallel or transverse to the magnetic field also for particle fusion you get this and also and you have five five shear viscosity coefficients let me also skip over this it's uh, it's not uh, not so important right now i also don't discuss this and i also don't discuss these transport coefficients there are some interesting dynamics going on as a function of magnetic field no? Uh, which which is shown in these transparencies. Let me briefly tell you that we managed to also look at um, this for not for particles with spin zero, but for particles with with finite spin. This we call this uh, um, MHD for polarizable fluids. No? And the Boltzmann equation, for instance, for spin one half, although I should non-zero spin would have been okay here at this point, but we did it for spin one half. David Wagner and myself we prepare in the manuscript. Uh, a lot of things changed. No? I mean, formerly we had K mu, del mu, but um, it's no longer the particle momentum here. It, that is actually corrected by something people call anomalous momentum. And that is something uh, I'm not explaining in more detail. Okay. And then it's on top of the, on top of the Lorentz force on the particle, you get also something which is called Matheson force. It's basically in inhomogeneous electromagnetic fields, the dipoles, the particles are now dipoles. And then, of course, you can also uh, deflect dipoles. Stern Gerlach experiment, we just mentioned it in the, when we did the chit chat in the, uh, before the talk. I mean, the Stern Gerlach experiment is, is hitting here. Yeah? You, have a, a, you have a magnetic, uh, magnetic mob, dipole moment. This is given by this microscopic polarization tensor, which I don't explain now. Look at it later on. But if there's gradients in F, F mu nu, then you see that how this deflects particle, particle trajectories. And of course, you have to carry on with the spin index, stuff like that. And of course, there would also be an equation for spin dynamics, which in this setup we neglected. We assumed spin dynamics to be much, the time scale much uh, faster than other time scales. So you immediately get the spins to align or anti align with the magnetic field. But then you can actually find interesting effects that have been discussed recently, like the chiral separation effect with the chiral separation effect conductivity, which you can compute as a function of particle mass, okay? Or this is to order h bar. If you go to order h bar squared, uh, then you can even compute the, magnet, the electric magnetic susceptibilities as a function of mass. So all this is very interesting. Let me skip over this, I have four minutes. Let me go to the last application I would like to, so, so this is all very recent stuff now. Um, so spin hydrodynamics. So now make the spin dynamical, but we threw out the electromagnetic fields for the moment. So that was actually Nora Weikernan's uh, uh, PhD thesis, which is a, a monumental effort that she did there. Uh, she first derived the Boltzmann equations, a Boltzmann equation for spin one half particles from quantum from the quantum field theoretical equation of motion for the Wigner function in the first order in H bar, semi classical expansion. So that was uh, summarized in the PRL and the PRD. And you see the very nice intuitive result she found was um, the collision term in the Boltzmann equation is ex extended to contain lo non local parts. Okay, so instead of this F, F prime minus. 
uh, sorry, F1, F1 prime minus F, F prime that we have seen previously last week. Yeah, we have now something where the position is shifted and the position shift is related to spin and momentum. It's of order of the Compton wavelength. Okay, so this is a non-local collision term. Also, in order to write this down, she had to invent some nice tricks, extend phase space by spin space, yeah, introduce a spin vector uh, that also requires you to generalize these um, momentum integrations to a momentum and spin integration. I'm not going through this in detail. Uh, the non-locality is proportional to the Compton wavelength, which is of the order of the interaction range, of course. So it's a scale much, much smaller than the mean free path between scatterings usually. And that again was much, much smaller than L hydro. But the non-locality allows you to convert orbital angular momentum that the particles have in the collision into spin and vice versa. So this spin orbit coupling actually provides a microscopic mechanism for the Barnett effect, which is when you rotate the fluid of polarizable particles, they, the spins will align. So that maybe you have heard of this. It's similar to the Einstein, the Haas effect. Okay, so all these interesting things are hiding in, is a micro, in this microscopic equation, but then she did one extra step and she actually derived spin hydrodynamic equations of motion using DNMR theory of moments to, uh, to derive these equations. And so in brief, because I'm running out of time, um, if you include spin, you would have to uh, write down an additional conservation law, namely the conservation law for total angular momentum. And um, if, you, if you plug the, this definition here, this is the definition of the total angular momentum density tensor. If you plug this in, you will actually, the, you will supplement your ordinary hydrodynamic equations already at this stage by six additional equations for, comp for, the, for components of the spin tensor. Okay, so this right-hand side comes from these terms here when you do the calculation. And, uh, and you can also see that this guy is anti-symmetric, can be made anti-symmetric in new lambda because only the anti-symmetric components here appear. So that has six uh, components, then the anti-symmetric part, but then times four because there's an extra Lorentz index mu. So you have actually 24 additional variables in the setup. And in order to get equations of motion for these 24 additional variables, you use DNMR theory. That's what she did. And of course, to see all the details, you would have to invite her for another seminar. <laughs> and there were many issues to be clarified. For instance, the, the splitting between uh, orbital angular momentum here, the first two terms, and spin in quantum field theory, in relativistic quantum field theory, is not well defined. There is a certain degree of freedom, which is called pseudo gauged degree of freedom or pseudo gauge dependence, for which you can shuffle terms between angular, orbital angular momentum and spin. Okay, and you have to choose, make a clever choice of pseudo gauge to actually uh, make this as simple as possible. And then the next issue that came up is that um, this non local collision term, yeah, I mean, usually a collision term should vanish in local thermodynamical equilibrium. Yeah? I mean, the concept of local thermodynamical equilibrium tells you no more collisions, or at least the collisions are balanced yeah, between gain and loss term. And that doesn't seem to work with these non-local non terms that were found. And one had to, uh, and only in global equilibrium, we could see that this vanishes, okay. We know that the system eventually will go to global equilibrium, but yeah, you, uh, you, you wanted, uh, hydrodynamics is all about uh, being around local equilibrium. So what is local equilibrium in this theory? So we had to, in order to find a meaningful concept of local equilibrium, we had to introduce the modified power counting. In essence, it is that, you know, the standard terms of order Knudsen number, yeah, radians of beta, alpha, or, or fluid velocity. I could have included theta here as well. Yeah, I mean, there's also vorticity usually that we originally counted as Knudsen number, but that's no longer true. Knudsen number, can, uh, vorticity can be much, much larger than Knudsen number. And it's true because there are systems which, gl which globally rotate, rigid rotation is actually also a local, is also a global equilibrium state, but the vorticity the rot of this fluid rotation can be arbitrarily large. Now, yeah. And then the, the last step was to introduce something which is similar to these rho, these irreducible moments, 
that you've seen previously, but now for spin. So instead of just having this EK to the power R times irreducible tensor, you also multiply this with spin and then you introduce spin moments. And, and she, then she derived relaxation type equations for the dissipative components of the spin tensor. And they actually have this form here. For instance, for the sigma zero mu, there's a relaxation term with the co-moving derivative. And on the right-hand side, there's something which looks like an obvious Stokes term and some higher order stuff, which I don't write down. And the interesting thing was, if you, uh, if you expand this, um, this non-local collision term in powers of h bar, the zeroth order gives you a local term you know, because this delta, zeroth order means you will neglect the delta here, you neglect the first order in h bar. The zeroth order gives you these uh, relaxation times, the local part of the collision term. So the spin diffusion is given by local collisions, so to speak, but the non-local part that gives you this Navier-Stokes type term. And it's proportional to the difference of something what we call spin potential and thermal vorticity related to fluid vorticity. And it, we know in global equilibrium, the non, also the non-local part of the collision term must vanish. So uh, this difference is zero. So these guys are equal in global equilibrium. But you see, when you're in local equilibrium, there's always a mismatch between spin potential and thermal vorticity. And that is the Navier-Stokes driving term. And you know, Navier-Stokes were also gradients, the gradients of fluid velocity or alpha and beta. In global equilibrium, all gradients are zero. In global equilibrium, this is zero. So also diffusion, spin diffusion stops. But as long as you're in local equilibrium, you have a driving, a dissipative force that drives spin diffusion. Okay, here are actually, is actually a plot of the spin relaxation times there are three different types. I didn't write down all these equations. They are of order one in mean free path. And these are the standard, um, standard, uh, uh, this standard relaxation times for bulk uh, particle diffusion and, um, and uh, shear stress. And they are a little larger, but they are the same order of, as the spin relaxation time. So spin dynamics is somehow Happens on a slightly shorter time scale, but it is of it is a, it is a transient effect. Okay, I uh, managed to keep myself almost up to yeah five minutes over time, but here are my conclusions. Né? So um, I didn't prove that this is a causal or stable framework, but it, it provides a causal stable framework, second order dissipative fluid dynamics. You can system you can derive it from an underlying microscopic theory like the Boltzmann equation, and and in a Consistent and systematically improvable framework, it's basically DNMR theory that you use. And then I briefly discussed three applications of DNMR theory. There are many more. I didn't talk about anisotropic hydrodynamics. I didn't talk about um, multi-component fluids, which we also did recently. Uh, but I think I'm, I am already over time and I hope I gave you a, an impression of uh, what can be done with DNMR theory and how powerful it is. And, how, uh, how you can derive uh, theories of recent interest, which I also had no time to talk about, but we can, uh, we can discuss maybe a little more. That's it. Super, uh, thank you. Let me... We lost Daniel, but I guess he had to go to some tutorial or whatever. Yeah. I, don't uh, know. I, I have a number of questions, but uh, yeah. I know that you need to run at some point. So maybe we will ask questions until you just cut us off. Um, but also let me throw the floor open to, to others to ask questions first. Mm -hmm. no, nobody dares to ask. Hopefully not. It was not too complicated. Well, let me start. And then the maybe, maybe that will sort of shake loose some of the questions. So mm -hmm. maybe a... Let me start with the most unfair question, which, which I really like. So I, I teach fluids to first year physicists or well, really first year engineers. And mm -hmm. I always like to tell them that Navier Stokes is one of the uh, clay million dollar mathematics prizes uh, that won. Uh, there are questions about existence and uniqueness, uniqueness of solution for non-relativistic uh, yeah. dissipative uh, fluid dynamics. And I, I wonder if, uh, or to what extent those problems extend also to the relativistic version? Yeah. 
Um, what I also did not mention is a, is a development of making, of removing this problem by, uh, um, by staying at first order. And that is possible. This is when you would have to uh, invite George, for instance, to give you a talk about this, George Loronia. This is now called uh, BDNK theory. And the Benfica, Disconsi, Noronia, Koftun. So uh, it all amounts to relaxing um, this assumption here, down here. So if you, if you don't use Landau matching, you can actually construct stable and causal theories, first order theories, so basically Navier Stokes. And, and I think they also proved uh, uniqueness in the existence of solutions. It's possible, right? So there, there is, it's possible to do this. Hmm? But you need, but you need extra input, obviously, right? You exactly. Need and then, and my my problem is then, what do I do if if I if I have a basically, in in my language, uh, can immediately throw this out at you. In my language, it means that this row one and this row two are no longer zero. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because that was that came from the Landau matching. Yeah? So this is yeah. they would call this delta n and delta e. So my 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 framework here provides you equations of motion for row one and row two. So I can provide this extra input, no problem. No? Um, um, but uh, what I don't understand is then how should I match? I mean, then then this this equilibrium state is somewhat arbitrary. You can take whatever you like. Right. You have to fix this in this decomposition. Huh? Mm, yeah. Otherwise, you have no choice uh, of uh, fixing P, the pressure. Huh? This is the thermodynamic pressure. It's related to E and N, epsilon zero and zero. Mm. And so, um, so I don't know. They, they, I don't think they ever worried about applying this to a real physics problem. You know, here's my initial state. Here are my boundary conditions. Now let me evolve partial differential equations. In order to evolve them, they would have to fix, they would have to say what is T and U of this fictitious local equilibrium state. So they would have to do something about it. Um, and, and they may, if they, if they just do something arbitrary, they may actually end up with very large values of corrections to this, uh, to this state. And then you, its power accounting would, would go wrong. But of course, everything is fine. It's closed. Everything is, is great, you know, I mean, yeah. I so, mean, so uh, Re restoring causality does not, I will talk uh, to does not give you information on, 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 on these things. Oh, they do. Actually, this is another good point. Um, so you have, there, there, are, there is, of course, in this theory, there's also a set of uh, relations relating all these uh, quantities with, uh, to each other. Mm -hmm. And for causality and stability, there, there are certain conditions to be fulfilled. So these are the constraints within which you can solve this theory properly. But it doesn't fix it completely. OK, now I get it. I don't think it fixes it completely. Yeah. Okay. You need some microscopic input, like here, like mm -hmm. a Boltzmann equation to tell you how these guys evolve. I think, if I understand it correctly, I may be wrong, but don't. please invite George to explain this to you and ask him this question. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah. OK. Very good. Super. Well, I'm going to yeah. keep throwing questions out there um, unless other people jump in. Um, yeah. So you have these 57 transport coefficients, um, mm -hmm. and <laughs> sounds fantastic, actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let me let me yeah go ahead with the question, then I will. Yeah. So I have two sort of directions to go in with that. So one is um, you know the the heavy ion community is going in this direction of very complicated Bayesian statistics and extraction of parameters. Mm -hmm. So are you aware of a program? to implement all of these 57 transport coefficients and then extract them using some kind of Bayesian-like analysis. Yeah, the question is how serious do you take this uh, theory? No? I mean, um, this Bayes Bayesian analysis was always biased by the underlying theory. No? You can only ex extract something when you, uh, you know, there's a framework in which you extract them. I mean, if, if you introduce more of this stuff, then uh, you will, I mean, if you introduce all these terms, no, the red, green, and blue stuff here, <laughs> then you will certainly uh, change the extraction of, let's say, a first order trans transport coefficient because you gave you a, 
your theory uh, freedom to uh, walk, walk into a different directions. No? So this, by Bayesian analysis is biased <laughs> by the input, by the theory input. So I never liked it that much, to tell you the truth. Um, you, of course, microscopically, we did compute all of them. I mean, actually, we didn't compute all of them. We computed the reasonable ones. Um, so we computed the green stuff. Uh, you know, once you have the cross section and uh, you know what your particles are made of, and how their masses are, whatever, then you just turn the crank and compute them. Then you assume binary collisions usually and you get numbers. I mean, these, these numbers here in the table, Gabriel produced some time ago for his PhD. They were constant, constant cross section, classical statistics, no Boltzmann statistics, massless particles, no. And 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 these uh, this plot here that that David produced for me actually here you, know, you could see there was in the mass was varied so he did this the classical statistics but for finite mass particles so it's m over temperature here mm -hmm. you see that they vary a little bit these values are the ones from the table uh, in fourteen moment approximation but of course you can improve this as as you see here no? so so some of these guys were computed. And uh, some others, uh, yeah, I mean, you, there's still lots of freedom to compute them, but it's always about the assumptions that go there. Yeah? I mean, if it's, if it's a, if it's a multi-component system, like Jan Fotakis now, student of Karsten, uh, considered, of course, they all will change because uh, you change your microscopic input. Yeah? So given your microscopic input, all these guys will change. Yeah? Yeah, but I mean, of course, some are not, some are more important than others. No? So when we, for the first time, computed the, this is not fire. No, this is fire. Okay, when the first time computed these guys here, they come from actually uh, the delta f squared correction. I'm oh, sorry. So when you when you linearize this collision integral here, here, this from these corrections in classical statistics, this, there is, you can actually compute them. There's only delta F squared and you compute all these corrections and then you get these pi squared and other terms. No? So when we computed the phi's here, we saw some of them were small, some were large. And I think the community has uh, simply believed us in <laughs> taking the few ones which were large for a classical massless gas of, particles with constant cross section. Of course, I mean, that's stupid. Uh, you should sit down and compute that in QCD or whatever, at least in a realistic QCD cross section and see whether that's really true. Huh? Yeah, I think that's basically right where I'm going, which is, I mean, yeah. we have this huge program of second order viscous relative physics hydrodynamics with using Israel Stewart, and, you know, they extract eta and then sometimes zeta too. And I mean, for self consistency's sake, they should include all of these, right? Yeah, I mean, you would have to solve it with all of them. Uh, give them, yeah, if you give them some input and then make uh, make this analysis, see what the likeliest values are. I mean, that would be very interesting. Mm. Uh, but it's of course a huge effort. That's no? fifty. Okay, I should say, say something about the red stuff, which you should have. Uh, you, you should have complained <laughs> because I told you that a first order, you know, Navier-Stokes is a causal because you get second order derivatives. These are all second order derivative terms here. Then. <laughs> so in principle, they don't appear, these, all these uh, tilde transport coefficients, they're all zero in 14 moment approximation for the, um, in this sense here, in the, in the sense that I explained here. No? When I, my basis, my polynomial basis is the smallest possible one. Then all these red coefficients are actually zero. But as soon as you increase the basis here, you will actually, these red coefficients will pop up. These terms come from the truncation in the, in the dynamical moments. And if you, if you go to, um, where did I do this? If you go to more dynamical moments, they, they, they disappear again, okay? So, I mean, this, this theory with more dynamical moments is the one where the red stuff, which potentially violates causality, is gone. But, of course, the red, these guys, these, these have also transport coefficients, right? the equation of motion for these, 
additional dynamical moments have other transport coverage that need to be computed and enter the game. And this was done in this paper here. I mean, that actually was a very nice work, I thought. You could see that in, in situations with large gradients, this is actually a better, a better theory you know, in some mm. sense. Uh, but of course, you don't want to do this. Uh, don't want to tell the community you should forget about fourteen moment uh, DNMR. Do twenty three moment DNMR. I mean, people will get crazy. <laughs> say, what? What we did all the time was wrong. <laughs> it was useless. <laughs> now, yeah, you have to read the fine print. Huh? In the... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so the, the I, other I direction. I only have to. Sorry. Oh, so, so yeah. Sorry. So the other direction that I was thinking about in terms of these 57 transport coefficients was um, has anybody been, let's call it brave enough to compute them in ADS-CFT? Yeah, the, the problem with the ADS-CFT guys is that they, they, they firmly believe in the, in the gradient expansion because that's the only thing they can do. No? They, they uh, compute the first order gradients in Einstein's equations and then read off the components of team you knew. So all they get are uh, basically second order gradients. It's basically second order gradient theory, which is also a causal and unstable. Okay. <laughs> so um, so uh, so you add some terms here, which actually look precisely like the red stuff that I added. So all this, all, they get a subset of the red stuff when they do it co correctly, and then they read this off from Einstein's equations. And, uh, and then uh, they make some outrageous claims. For instance, I want actually a term that they write down, which is actually hiding in, this, in these terms is, is a term which all the time derivatives, okay? So there is actually a, a time derivative of pi mu nu hiding somewhere in, in, all, in, in, in a combination of these terms. There's a sigma dot. And that sigma dot, they say, oh, we can replace this to first order by pi dot, right? Because to first order, um, to first order, sigma dot is pi dot. You just have to divide by eta or so now. Make a proper chain rule, product rule uh, replacement. And then they, they, by hand, get equations which look like this here. But originally there, uh, pi dot was a sigma dot. Yeah, so they actually mutilate whatever they had done previously in the perfectly sensible gradient expansion, they mutilate this and man massage it to, to look like an Israel Sua transient fluid dynamical theory. And then they start to identify transport coefficients. And that's, that's always why eta, that the eta they get, sorry, the tau pi they get is always a combination of tau pi and eta because it, 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 was, it originated from a, from a sigma dot, which they replaced by pi divided by eta. So uh, I'm, I, I, did, I did not want to comment on this because it's uh, what they're doing is nonsense. Ah, oh, very good. Well, I'm glad this is going on to YouTube. Oh my <laughs> God! Now I'm really getting now I'm getting the heat. <laughs> but it it is actually, I mean, we we investigated this in detail, and there is a, one particular situation where. Um, where what they extract is identity is correct is the correct value, but it's it's related to the um, to the Green's function of of the of this prime. So this differential equation has a Green's function, and if that has certain properties, you can actually show that the e, the tau they extract is correct in in one particular instance. Mm. But um, but otherwise, it's it's an arbitrary thing. Sorry, I mean. Now I will may, may get a lot of heat, and but if there are only two YouTube clicks, it's <laughs> but uh, it, it, I mean we have kept them telling this for many for many years, but it was uh, it was hard to to penetrate through the barrier, uh, yeah. the black yeah. hole. Exactly. <laughs> well, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, this is good. I I really appreciate this. Now I'm I'm just keeping an eye on the time. So let me just ask one one more question. I do yeah, have one more, one. and then I have to. Run. Yeah. yeah. So okay. um, there's all this this big splash where people have been looking at the polarization uh, in heavy ion collisions. Like I think polarized lambdas coming yeah. from the large magnetic field. Perfect. Um, yeah. So would would your work with this? spin hydro and the spin magnetohydrodynamics, do you think that that would inform 
uh, some of these, these measurements and the interpretation of them. Excellent, yeah, good that you mentioned this because I didn't mention any applic applicability of this or range of applicability of these theories. Yeah, so the, that was the motivation to, to derive this theory né, that you can describe the polarization puzzle. There's this lambda polarization puzzle. So somehow um, people have uh, computed polarization in a hydrodynamic framework, but what they did is they computed the Pauli Lubanski vector on a freeze out hypersurface, assuming local equilibrium, uh, actually assuming that the vorticity, the spin potential is equal to the thermal vorticity. And, and that didn't match the experimental data. And now the, the question is why not? And there were many uh, things proposed. And uh, in some sense, this framework that we have uh, devised here um, could provide the terms that were pro proposed that could repair this uh, or could explain the spin polarization part. But I think it's a bit too early to, uh, to claim success. First of all, we didn't do any calculation of spin polarization within this framework. And, uh, and Francesco Beccatini has done much more work on this and uh, has uh, provided lots of clues to solve it, but there's still some open questions and we were not able to completely understand the relationship of what he's doing and what we are doing. So, I mean, the, and it's all related to this pseudo gauge dependence. We are not even sure we have computed the right object because of the pseudo gauge dependence, right? If some, your observable cannot be pseudo gauge dependent, right? You have to make sure that you're computing the right thing. And uh, I think we, are, we have an ongoing discussion of this, but it's, it's exciting. And, uh, and we hope that we can understand more when we keep digging deeper, but at this point, the hope is yes, but uh, so far the status quo is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to do. And of course, this was all related to vorticity. You know? Then the, all these issues about magnetic fields and chiral magnetic effects and all this other stuff that that somehow um, the focus is has shifted because that uh, yeah CME magnetic fields are so so short lived and nobody really thinks that they can really introduce a CME current and that can be observable and also this. Uh, Beam energy scan result on the on the um, isotope, not isotope, isotope run, isobar. Sorry, isobar run. They did rubidium and zirconium, and they thought they get uh, a situation which with comparable dynamics, bulk dynamics, but different magnetic fields. It turns out the bulk dynamics is completely different because one is octopole deformed and the other is quadrupole deformed, and you get different multiplicities and different uh, elliptic flow. And I think what they found out was that uh, heavy ion collisions is another way to determine nuclear structure. <laughs> <laughs> Extracting <laughs> nuclear structure from the elliptic and, uh, and uh, triangular flow coefficients, but unfortunately no CME inside so far. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Well, that was yeah, very really, good, guys. I hope yeah. I hope it was uh, enjoyable, and also to the world out there. Sorry about my nasty remarks about ADS CFD. I think it was a it was at that time it was a, a great development to see how fluid dynamics and uh, and conformal theories in in curved space time can be related. I think it, I don't want to diminish the value of this, but I mean to do this uh, simple replacement of a you know, I mean, making a totally acausal, unstable theory causal and stable by, uh, by, uh, by a trick, changing the nature, changing an algebraic relation into a partial differential equation. I mean, anybody solving partial differential equations will tell you uh, that uh, this is somehow, uh, yeah, you, you, you're doing different things there. Yeah. Uh, that's my personal opinion. But you can invite, uh, um, Michael Heller to explain to you precisely why this is still the same thing to do. <laughs> I, I don't understand it completely, but I think he knows this much better than I do. Okay. All right. Well, super. I mean, that was for me really, really great, Dirk. I, I really deeply appreciate it. That was, I learned a lot um, and I have a lot of 
pointed questions for other scientists, which is always great. So, so thank you really very much for, for taking yeah. the time. Yeah, my pleasure. It was also, for me, it was hard work, but it was also good to prepare this talk. And you see, I still have a few typos there, which I will amend and then send you the PDF to post it Super. somewhere. In your... We'll upload it for the world to appreciate. Yeah, yeah, okay. My nasty remarks are at least not on the PDFs. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Okay, very good. Then it was great seeing you guys again and uh, thank you. I'll see you in person.